I love um, that hymn, and, and in particular, when we think about Peter, and we think about um, his sin, and we think about um, how easy it is to judge him, and I love the verse that, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes a moment from Jesus, a pardon receives, and what a picture it is of redemption for Peter and for us, um, and I thought this hymn was very appropriate. Uh, so a couple of announcements. Um, really, the main one is don't come next week <laughs> because we won't be here. Uh, so uh, it's spring break, and uh, I was joking with the guys. I've been praying really hard. And uh, I'm glad to tell you that the Lord has answered our prayers, and it's going to be 67 degrees next Wednesday while we're out on spring break, right? So um, I do want to thank you for being here tonight, though. I know when you, when you walk in and it's still bright and sunny outside, you think, oh my gosh, I could get a lot done. And uh, so I appreciate you uh, making this important. And just a reminder, too, about the Revelation study. Um, we are excited about it. And... Um, the Lord is going to do great things in this class, and uh, please consider inviting some friends uh, to come with you and uh, explore this, or maybe a son or grandson. Um, if you would bow your heads with me, I will um, lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, we do praise you. We thank you for um, your gift. We thank you for the word of God, and we thank you for what we have been learning in the book of John, and Lord, how you are revealing yourself to us in this book. Thank you for making yourself known to us. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit that we could understand what we're reading. And today, Lord, as we study um, you just marching to the cross, I just pray that you would change us. Um, I pray that the words I speak, Lord God, would be pleasing to you and would also be effective. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, John 16, says, in this world, you will have trouble. Troubles and challenges are unavoidable and most often unexpected. For Jesus, the potentate of time, the omniscient God of the universe, the events recorded in chapter 18, though, were not a surprise. As a matter of fact, we've already studied and we know that Jesus predicted his betrayal and we now see him choose a familiar place to go and pray with his disciples in order to initiate his sacrifice for mankind. Jesus was calm, and he did not shrink back or hide from his calling. He made himself available to the officers, and he went willingly. When unjustly pressed by the former chief priest, Annas, to indict himself, Jesus was steadfast despite the abuse he endured. In contrast, think of Peter and his actions. We see Peter not calm and collected, but rather impulsive and then cowering. Immaturity was on display. Peter illustrated how reliance on emotions and self-effort will fail us. While Peter knew the Messiah as well as anyone, he'd even received years of teaching from Jesus. And by all accounts, Peter was a true believer, but he failed. But before we judge Peter too harshly, let's remember that Peter was not indwelt with the Holy Spirit at this time. So his impulsive actions were motivated by his flesh versus the Spirit. The coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was still some 50 days away. So after studying the Holy Spirit recently, it's a strong reminder to us of the power that is available to us in our lives through the Advocate. Knowing God is not enough. <clears throat> we must believe in Jesus. We must believe in his substitutionary death for us, his resurrection, and his ascension. And then, if we desire to be spiritually mature, we must submit to making him Lord of our lives. And then, be led by the Spirit to transform our thinking, to overcome fears, and to experience the freedom that Christ offers us in this life. So we'll talk more about Peter, but for now, let me share my two divisions. 
The first is verses 1 through 11, Jesus' faithfulness. And the second, verses 12 through 27, Peter's unfaithfulness. So as we start this book, chapter 18, we see Jesus willingly initiate his sacrifice. Said, it says in uh, verse 1, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with the disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley on the other side where there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went there. So we know that he went there, and we know that it was a familiar place to Judas, um, and we see false power descending on the all-powerful. Judas knew of the garden where Jesus had gone, and therefore he, that was the first place he went with the soldiers carrying weapons to arrest Jesus in verses 2 and 3. Well, Jesus knew exactly what was happening. He wasn't surprised. And he, as a matter of fact, went to meet the guards and the soldiers, acknowledging that he was Jesus in whom they had sought. And I didn't catch this in my study, but as we were talking last night in our um, leaders meeting, one of the group leaders said, um, I know this isn't one of the I am statements, but Jesus did say I am twice. He said, I am he. And he said it two times. We seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And when he said, I am he, they fell to the ground, it says. Well, we see Jesus encounter the men. He's very clear, but we see Peter reacting very differently. Man's human reaction to conflict. Peter drew his sword. He cut the man's ear off, the uh, priest's servant. And then Jesus rebuked him and said, should I not drink the cup that my father has given me? And we see this um, dedication that Jesus has to his mission and to his calling. So in this short little section, my principle is that spirit-led decisions and actions are counter to the world's expectations. Verses 1 through 11, we see stark contrast. First, we see Jesus model a spirit-led reaction to those wanting to harm him. Jesus was calm, and he was clear as, the, as he was approached by armed men seeking to arrest him. Jesus was so calm in his spirit that he actually had time to think not just of himself, but also of the disciples to make sure that they were not harmed. He was quick to intervene also when Peter cut the guard's ear off. And we read in other books in the New Testament, other um, gospels where Jesus not only intervened, but he also healed the guard right there on the spot. But Jesus made sure it didn't escalate as well. But Peter, in contrast, fresh off of telling Jesus in chapter 13, Jesus, I would die for you. I would lay down my life for you. Here he has the chance. So maybe Peter was trying to overcome the rebuke that Jesus had given him, saying that he would not only um, not do that, but he would deny him. Maybe he was trying to prove it. Verse 10 tells us that Peter drew his sword and inflicted a serious wound. Without Jesus intervene, intervening and healing the servant's ear, Peter may very well have laid his life down right there. So us mere mortals, we often fall short. We often fail to be spirit-controlled, as Jesus modeled. We may instead ignore the, the truth, um, the spirit of truth's counsel, and let our fight-or-flight tendencies short-circuit our thinking, cause us to react in a way that doesn't look or sound spirit-led. Our reactions may actually escalate instead and might even permanently damage. Think of times, men, where you have maybe let your anger boil or maybe let a comment come out of your mouth that cut really deeply. At the very least, might damage your witness, might have damaged your witness, but the worst, it might damage another's view of God. So when do your emotional reactions and your first inclinations lack alignment with God's will of love for God and love for others. In chapter 18, Jesus models what we should aspire to live out. Even 
in the midst of unjust persecution. Jesus did not falter. As God, of course, we know he's incapable of sinning, but that's not the same for you and me, is it? We've studied and we've learned and we've studied and we've learned that if we have made Jesus Christ our Lord, then we do, in fact, have the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, which includes how to respond in godliness at all times. The Spirit tells us what to do, but do we listen? When we fail, do we shrink back or do we repent? Galatians 5, 16 says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That was modeled for us by Jesus, but it was obviously not modeled by Peter. You might think that sounds impossible to do. And I would say without the power of the Holy Spirit, you are correct. But praise God, as believers, we do have the Spirit. We do have the Spirit living inside of us. The world we live in, though, men, loves division and loves conflict. The world likes to see emotion. The world likes to see battle. But that's not, we, that's not what we as believers are called to. We're called to peace and we're called to love. And so you might also ask, but where do I start if I'm struggling in this area, if I'm struggling with anger, if I'm struggling with the words I use, if I'm struggling and I look a lot like Peter, where do I start? And I would say, start with prayer. We've talked a lot about the, the biblical recipe for Christian maturity, spiritual maturity. One, accept Jesus as Lord. Two, be in the word, read the word. Three, develop a prayer life. Four, be in community. Five, serve. And six, give generously. So if this calm and graceful and peaceful disposition is something that you want in your life, I encourage you to start thinking about your intake. What are you taking in that can transform you or should be transforming you? What is in your life that runs counter to this goal, to this desire, to the gospel. And then pray to the Holy Spirit to help you. Ask for his help. Listen to the prayers of the psalmist. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. That's Psalm 5, 8. And Psalm 27, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Both of these psalms were psalms of David, a man after God's own heart. The world bombards you and I, especially as men, and challenges us to go your own way, to overachieve, to be independent. But that is not God's way, and that is not what Jesus modeled. If we want to live spirit-led lives and we want to produce the fruits of the spirit, we have to access the spirit and continuously seek transformation in our heart, in our soul, and in our mind by his power, not by our strength, by his power. And this requires personal sacrifice. It does. Not just your time and your talent, and your treasure, but also our motives. We must die to ourselves and we must live for Jesus. So what keeps you from intentionally and consciously laying down your life, your dreams, and your motivation with the goal of glorifying God? Consider Peter's immaturity in this week's passage. He did not have the gift of the Holy Spirit yet, so his reaction was that of a man reacting in the flesh. The Spirit was coming, and so was radical transformation in Peter's life, but the Spirit is available to you and I. And so I ask you, do you know him? Do you seek him? And do you reflect him? Let's look at the second division, which is verses 12 through 27. So we see once again the all-powerful dealing with unjust power. 
Jesus was arrested and he was bound and he was brought to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest Caiaphas. In verses 12 through 14, we read this. And my Bible mentioned uh, that he was brought to, to Annas, who was the father of the high priest, but then we see the guard later on refer to him as the high priest. And um, the notes do a pretty good job of walking through this, but Annas was um, the father-in-law. He also, I believe, had five sons who had served as high priest as well. So Annas was kind of like the kingpin of the high priest. And so that's, I think, why um, he went to that uh, place first. But Jesus was questioned by Annas about his disciples and about his teaching. And again, Jesus, Jesus didn't fall into the trap. Jesus didn't let himself be, um, be twisted, and he didn't defend himself. He basically spoke truth. He was questioned, and he answered that all of his teachings had been in public. I've not hidden. I've been straightforward. I've always taught and spoken openly in the world. In the, in the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Why don't you go ask those who have heard me? And at that point, we see one of the officers strike Jesus on the face, and this is where we hear him say, uh, is that any way to speak, basically, to the high priest? And at that point, Jesus questions the guard. He said, if anything I said is untrue, tell me what it is. Why did you strike me? And at that point, Annas saw that he was not going to get a... Um, any kind of uh, words or things that could be used against Jesus. So he went ahead and sent him on to Caiaphas, we read. So, so that's one little vignette of this section. And then there's another vignette of this section, which is all about Peter. And so we look at verses 15 through 18, and then also 25 through 27, and we see this cadence of Peter's denial. So first we see Simon Peter and another disciple follow uh, Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. We know that the other disciple, which we assume was John, um, went in and then came back and got Peter entrance. And at that point, Peter comes in and the servant girl says, aren't you one of his disciples? She says, you're also one of the man's disciples, aren't you? And this is Paul, uh, Peter's first time to say, I am not. And later, Peter is questioned twice more, um, Someone says to him, you are also not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And finally, a relative of the man whose ear he cut, we read, asked him again, and he said, we read in verse 27, that again he denied it. So three times he denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. And so you can kind of imagine you've got Jesus leaving for Caiaphas, and you've got you've got Peter denying Jesus and the rooster crowing. I imagine those happened simultaneously. I imagine Jesus is leaving the house. He's outside. He hears the rooster crow, and he knows what took place. Peter must have been crippled with guilt. Well, let's look at our final principle, men. In spite of our great mistakes and failures, there is an even greater hope in Christ's willing sacrifice. This is a long principle. I'm going to read it again, and I really want you to hear it. In spite of our great mistakes and failures, there is an even greater hope in Christ's sacrifice. Chapter 18 details Peter's epic fail and denying of Jesus three times, as Jesus had foretold. How terrible Peter must have felt when he heard the rooster crow or the notes tell us that it might have been a Roman military trumpet that was referred to as a, as a rooster. Either way, this was not Peter's first failure, we know that. He was often the first to speak, and his words did not always align with Jesus' will and message. Here's what we will read in the final chapter of John, though. Jesus reinstates Peter. Jesus does not only forgive him, but he restores him. And as a disciple, and he challenges him, he says, feed my lambs. He says, take care of my sheep. He says, feed my sheep. So despite pending persecution that would come to Peter, 
Jesus gives him this challenge, gives him this trust. Had this been an experience that Jesus intended for Peter to walk through to strengthen his faith so that when he faced challenge in the future, he would remember? I believe so. Man, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and he knows the full story of our lives. These failures in Peter's life prepared him to be one of the key leaders of the Christian church. The power of the Holy Spirit that would indwell Peter and help him fully grasp the substitutionary death that Jesus submitted to for humanity would transform this rash individual into a mature follower of Christ, trusted and called to lead others for the sake of the gospel. Peter is not the only one in scripture that we know about, that we're familiar with, that has failed mightily. David, a man after God's own heart, was also an adulterer and a murderer. How was he restored? Paul, a zealous persecutor of Christians, responsible for the death and imprisonment of Christ's followers in the name of God. How was he restored? Well, let's look at David. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read about Nathan calling David to account for his sins against Bathsheba and for the murder of her husband Uriah. We read that David was convicted of his sin and he sought the Lord. In Psalm 51, we read, we can hear this brokenness before the Lord. David says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Let the bones, oh, excuse me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me your salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. Brokenness, repentance, falling upon the grace of the Lord. We know that Paul had a different experience. Paul was met on the road to Damascus by Jesus himself, who called him to see the error of his ways and to see that Jesus was, in fact, the true Messiah. Paul had hands laid on him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. And then he spent time in fellowship with other believers to mature his understanding of the gospel. And this propelled Paul to be the most prolific writer of the New Testament. And finally, Peter. Peter was restored by Jesus, but not just that. Peter was filled with the Spirit at Pentecost. Peter became a bold defender of the faith to Jews and Jewish leadership. He healed a crippled beggar, we can read in Acts, in Jesus' name, and he led the household of Cornelius to know the Lord, to be saved, Gentiles, to be saved, and he baptized them in that place. Peter sinned and erred, but he was restored and he was used mightily by the Lord. So when we read John 18 and we study this well-known passage on the denial of Peter, it is so easy to just cast stones at him and think, I can't believe he would do that. After all the time he had with Jesus, how in the world could he do that? But the truth is, you and I are at the risk of the same thing every single day if we're not on guard if we're not living by the Spirit. Have you had an opportunity, men, to testify of your relationship with Christ, maybe to acquaintances or family members, and you let it pass? You left it right there on the table and you didn't follow through? I have. When pressed to testify, men, what keeps us from proclaiming the name of Jesus? Is it fear? Is it unbelief? Is it a desire to avoid that awkward interaction? Probably all those things. But if we're being honest, every one of us in this room has failed. Every one of us. Not just failed to give a testimony, but we fail daily. Some in this room are living with hidden sin right now, and you desperately hope that no one will discover it. 
as men, we are so susceptible to sexual sin, to sins of addiction, to sins of pride or anger. The list goes on. We're all made the same, men. I don't think anything I'm saying is new news. But the question for us is, how do we deal with sin? How do we deal with sin in our life? And I ask the same question of myself. One, am I conscious of my sin? And two, am I grieved by it? Do I repent of it before the Lord like we see David, Paul, or Peter do? This week we're reading about Christ's willing walk to the cross. And men, this is exactly why he died. This is exactly why he gave his substitutionary sacrifice so that we could have victory over sin's grip on our life and receive complete and lasting forgiveness of our sins. Complete. That means past. That means the sins of today. And yes, that means the sins of the future. We are already forgiven because of what Jesus has done for us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit makes us aware of sin in our life. The question, the challenge to us is, do we listen? Do we listen to his voice and obey? So, some of you in this room have sinned greatly and may be stuck in that sin right now. And the Lord does not want that for you. The Lord does not want that for me. He doesn't want us trapped in sin he doesn't want us trapped in, in, it, in it currently, and he doesn't want us to be invalidated for the rest of our life because of error, large or small. And I think this is a really, really important message for all of us to hear because shame can really grip us. Shame can really move us backwards instead of forwards. And it's the blood of Jesus that we should fall on when we sin. Jesus came to redeem all who would put their trust in him. All who would put their trust in him. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are redeemed. And the sin and the errors of your life can be used and, and will be used to sanctify you, to mature you as a believer, to give you a witness that people can relate to, and to make you ever aware of the grace of Jesus Christ. So, how have you let failures, failures of the past, keep you frozen and ineffective in your personal ministry? Are you more aware of your guilt and shame sometimes than you are of God's call on your life to serve Him and to be used by Him? Each of us has a ministry. Christ has called every single one of us to a ministry. It might be a ministry in your home as the spiritual leader of your house or to your children or to your workplace or to your neighborhood or to your church. So how should the fact that after the denial that we read about with Peter, how should that fact and then Jesus restoring him calling him to spread the gospel, how should that impact you? What about David? Being restored from adultery and being restored from murder. A man after God's own heart. It's kind of hard to reconcile without grace. How about Paul being restored? I think of the picture of Stephen being stoned to death, and the last thing it says there is that Paul stood by approving. And then he goes on to dedicate his life for that same God that Stephen died for. So in spite of your great mistakes and failures, men, there is an even greater hope in Christ's willing sacrifice. He loves you. He's calling you. He's sanctifying you. Submit to him. Pursue him. And he will do amazing things in your life as he sanctifies you, renews your mind, and calls you to more. 
So as I open tonight, I mentioned that trouble is unavoidable, and most often it will catch you by surprise. As children of God, we have the Holy Spirit, though, living inside of us, and thus we have the power to respond in grace and the power to respond in strength, that strength. Sometimes it's the power to endure well. Jesus chastised Peter when he abruptly and foolishly brandished a sword and cut off one of the high priest's guard's ears. And he said, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And so I would say, men, if you're alive, we too have a cup. We have a cup that the Father has given us to walk with and in in our life. Each of ours are a little bit different, though. Each has been given to us for a different reason, to sanctify us to allow us to be the fragrance of Christ to the world around us. When people look at you, what do they see? Do they see immature, wild, and reactive Peter? Or do they see controlled by the Spirit, one who is able to contemplate life circumstances through the lens of faith, through the lens of the truth of the gospel, and to produce fruit of the Spirit even while you're walking through trials? Do those around you see the fruit of the Spirit? Do they see love? Do they see joy? Do they see peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? So as we continue to watch Jesus through these next chapters leading up to his crucifixion, let us keep in mind that he is modeling what we are called to do. He is modeling how we should walk. God said, be holy like I am holy. But also understand that we will fail, and he knows that. We are not God, and we are not capable of perfection. But when we do miss the mark, that's what's important. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Do we let the Holy Spirit convict us? Do we then bring our failures to the cross? Repent, turn from our sin by the power of the Spirit, and walk in knowledge of our forgiveness and our redemption. Go in peace, my friends. Have a great week. Have a great spring break.